Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and colleagues, it is my great honor and pleasure to welcome here this evening one of Israel's greatest living writers, Aleph Bet Yoshua. Described by the New York Times as a kind of Israeli Faulkner, Yoshua has authored 20 books, including nine novels, short stories, plays, and essays. He has been honored with many prestigious awards, among them the Israel Prize in 1995. His works have been published uh, in translation in 28 countries, and many have been adapted for film and theater, television, and opera. Yoshua has taught uh, comparative and Hebrew literature at the University of Haifa, was a writer in residence at uh, St. Paul's College, Oxford, and a visiting professor at Howard, University of Chicago, and Princeton. In an interview he gave several years ago, Yoshua said, and I'm quoting, Jews are the great experts of crossing boundaries, having a very strong nucleus of identity composed of religion, and nationality that could let them cross boundaries, end quote. And identities, Jewish, Israeli, Zionist, Sephardi and Ashkenazi, male and female, are definitely at the center of Aleph Bet Yoshua's writing. Born to a fifth generation Jerusalem Sephardi family, while at the same time a member of the so-called generation of the state, Dora Medina, alongside prominent authors such as Amos Oz, Arnon uh, Apefed, and uh, Yoram Kanyuk, Zichrono Livracha. Alephet Yoshua has clearly been intrigued by the question of identity and by the part history played in building it. And if I may allude to the above quotation, Yoshua, both the author and the public um, intellectual, in his attempt to capture uh, these identities, has himself often crossed boundaries. Writing a dialogue novel while omitting one side of the dialogue, as in Mr. Mani, diving into the period of Jewish history that never have been uh, dealt with before, as in journey to the end of the millennium, writing uh, a play about a culinary summit between David Ben-Gurion and Zev Jabutinsky, as in shall the two go together, at Fushnay Yichdav, or writing the libretto for the opera adaptation of journey to the end of the millennium, Masalek Tom and therefore, extremely uh, grateful that Aleph Bet Yoshua had also crossed the boundaries, or the geographical boundaries, of Ben Gurion Airport and landed here in Budapest today to celebrate with us the Hebrew Book Days and to offer insight into Israeli culture through examples extracted from his novels. So, Todaraba, Professor Yoshua. And uh, thank you all for joining us, and the floor is yours. I don't want to be alone with my jacket, so I took it off. <laughs> there is a famous saying by our great scholar, I would say the, the most important Jewish scholar in this 20th, in the 20th century, Gershom Scholem, the great uh, researcher of the um, of the mystic, the, the mystical trends in Jewish uh, philosophy. And he was saying something that was a little bit astonishing. He was saying, by Zionism, the Jews are returning to history. And it was a little bit uh, strange because we are always saying about ourselves that we are the most, one of the most ancient historical people in the world. 
And still he was saying during at least the last 2,000 years, we haven't been in history, but in mythology. And the return of Zionism to Israel, to the land of Israel, and the establishment of a state, it is a return and not an easy return to history. What is the meaning of what Sholem was uh, referring? And I have to explain it because I think that Israel itself, in these years, is in a crossroads about the attitude of the Israelis towards history or towards mythology. And this will determine, in my opinion, the fate of Israel for a long time. And especially in time in which every nation is hovering about the question of its identity, especially in the global, global area and the global identity, still the most important thing for Israel is if they will follow the European model of identity based on history or to go to the American model that is mainly identity based upon mythology. And this is a very important and very, uh, I would say, difficult choice of Israel today. Now, what we explain by speaking about mythology? What is mythology? There are many uh, uh, definitions. What is myth? What is the meaning of this elusive, so vital concept? Roland Barthes, the famous researcher of culture, speak of myths and mythology as acceptance of the world as it wants to be and not as it is. The word myths derived from the Greek mythos in the sense of a factually true condition. As in Homer writing, the noun denotes great authority and the verb denotes true telling. In Greek, according to the encyclopedia, myth is an attempt to explain the relationship between rationality and philosophical truths morality and religious belief, a pre-scientific attempt to interpret a certain real or imagined phenomena via the gods relationship among themselves and with human being. Or to put it in more, I would say, sharp word, human myth, human truth, and not the truth itself. The first thing that when we speak about mythos and myth is the, I would say, the, the extreme poles of this same word. In one word we speak about myth or mythology as a, I would say, supreme truth and in the same time we speak about mythos as a supreme lie. We say often this is not true, this is a mythos. For example, many times we spoke about, uh, about uh, the army of Israel after the defeat or the problem in Yom Kippur War, the strength, the mythos of, of uh, the army was broken, meaning it is not true, it was a mythos. The movement between supreme truth and in the same time supreme lie is something fundamental in the mythology. The myth, okay, it is a super story hovering above history, his effect in history after a certain time has been, I would say, faded. They cannot continue, they don't stand anymore. But mythos is something that is not concerned or it is not judged
by a certain place and time, but is above time and place. The most, I would say, obvious mythos is, for example, the crucifixion of Jesus. For many, many believers, after 2,000 years, the question if Jesus was crucified in a certain time, in a certain situation, is not important at all. The question of the crucifixion is becoming a kind of mythos that people all over the world can attach themselves to this mythos and find it as the supreme truth, not regarding the historical circumstances in which Jesus was uh, uh, destroyed. We have, and this is when we come to the Jews, and we want to examine what was the main component in the Jewish identity all over these 2,000 years. If you find a Jew in Poland, and a Jew in Yemen, and a Jew in Argentina, and a Jew in uh, Egypt, and you want to say what was, what was sharing between them, what was common between them, it was not history. Everyone was living in a different territory, in a different language, without any connection to other Jews, and still they felt Jew by holding together some mythology that was shared by all of them. Some super story. First of all, for example, the Exodus from Egypt. A Jew in Poland and a Jew in Yemen and a Jew in Argentina was saying to themselves, Everyone has to see himself as if he was coming out from Egypt or was liberated from the slavery in Egypt. And in this sense, people from, we don't know if there was an Oxodus from Egypt. The archaeologists say there was no, no slavery in Egypt. The Jewish people was born later and all this is a story. But the story itself is not important. The, the historical circumstances of the Exodus from Egypt is not important. It is a mythos, it is a mythology already, and people can relate themselves to this mythology and build their identity on that. Build their identity on that. And not only build their identity, but have to attach themselves and say, this is a very important thing in the Israel, in the Jewish mythology, in the Jewish identity. Everyone has to see himself as he himself was, was liberated from Egypt. And other, of course, examples. The mythos does not have any clear relationship to history. Take, for example, the day of mourning of Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av. In Israel, it is very special in the last years, in the last 20 years, <coughs> if you go to a cafe or you go to a cinema, it's closed. And if you ask uh, the people why this cinema is closed, they will say to you, because it is the day of mourning of the destruction of a temple. You ask them, which temple? And when it was destroyed, they say it was destroyed 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago and you close the cinema now because it was destroyed 2,000 years ago? No, they say. There was not only one temple that was destroyed. There were two temples that was destroyed. Two temples in the same day, in the same period? No. One was destroyed in 70 AD and one was destroyed in 580 BC, in difference of 600 years. Now what is the mythos? What is he doing? He taking one destruction of one temple that was 2,500 years. Then another destruction of temple that was destroyed 2,000 years ago. Combine them together and make it destruction and make the mythos of destruction and you have to attach yourself without any 
details why this temple was destroyed, why the other was destroyed. They were destroyed for totally different reasons, by two different, totally different people in two different periods of history. It's like taking, for example, one day in Hungary or in France, you are celebrating uh, in one day the commemoration of the war of 30 years in Europe in the uh, end of the Middle Ages with the, uh, the, the celebration of the First World War, making together. This is totally unhistorical attitude. And you cannot even oblige people to understand what was the reasons of this destruction. What lesson you can take from it. In this sense, the mythology that was working mainly on religion, and religion is working on mythology, this was the basic element that was feeding the Jewish identity. Or I will give you another example. If you go to a yeshiva, not here, perhaps, I don't know if there are yeshivas, but there are, of course, yeshiva, but let's say go to Brooklyn or to Israel, to Bnei Brak, you will see the, the students, the Avrechim, Haredim, studying very, very, with great passion, for example, the writing of the Rambam. They know by heart pages of the Rambam. Now you will ask them, when the Rambam was living, who was influencing him? What was his relationship to the Arab philosopher in his time? They don't know anything. They don't care about it. They don't want to know. Rambam could work, could be a, a, a philosopher of the 12th century, or of the 15th century, or of the 6th century. The most important is what he was writing all the historical context of uh, uh, his writing, of course, is unrelevant for them. Of course, this was the basic elements of mythology of the Jewish identity. Of course, many Jews could not stand, could not feed their identity with such mythology. We have been about four million in the ancient world. Four million. It was an important number. All the ancient world. I think about the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was about 70 million, and the Jews were about five or six percent of the population. We arrived to the 18th century with one million, meaning a lot of Jews had left the Jewish people and assimilated or converted to the Islam world or to the Christian world. No, many, not so many Jews could hold their identity without history, without the context of history, of relating to a territory, to relate to, the, uh, uh, to a language, to relate, to relate to responsibility, to a community. The Jews can be alone. The Jews can live on the moon and hold his identity with his mythology. He can repeat, uh, he doesn't need Jews around him in order to uh, uh, keep the Jewishness. Uh, I don't know if you know that when the Americans came, now they have done the, the last war in Iraq, they found one Jew, one Jew living in Baghdad, and he was living alone there for about, I don't know, 30 years. Alone. But if you examine him and say to him, he was no less Jewish than our Prime Minister. He is Jewish. And he can, keep, he can keep his Jewishness by some mythology, even the remainder of some mythology. He can, he can be even without religion. And he can keep his identity uh, in such way. This, of course, was an advantage but it was, of course, a big disadvantage. Because with mythology, you don't understand what is around you. You cannot change yourself. You can interpret the, myth the mythos, 
for example, the mythos of the Akedah, of the binding of Isaac, the very important mythos of, of uh, Abraham and Isaac. This is one of our basic mythology. You can interpret it, but you cannot say, I cannot accept it. I don't want it. I want to repair myself. I want to change. So in this basic thing, the Jews did not change. In, in the area of mythology, they can be more modern, they can, uh, uh, they can uh, uh, I would say, acting with machine, they can do many things, but their identity, their basic identity, I will take you, I will take Jews in New York, I will take Jews in Argentina, I will take Jews in, in many other places, you are the same. Alone, without responsibility to each other. There is the most, I would say, untrue mythology is speaking about a common Jewish destiny. <coughs> Never there was a common Jewish destiny. When Jews were in Auschwitz, in Poland, Jews in America were going to the stock market. There is no Jewish destiny. <coughs> Jews were there. Every Jew was connected to the destiny of the country in which he was living. And in this sense, the Jewish destiny is only a wishful thinking or a wish, but not the reality. But there was something that was all the time speaking about our Jewish destiny. And we repeat saying it, because in the mythology we have been, we were sharing the same identity. We have the same destiny in the mythology. But in the reality it was not like this. This is the reason why <coughs> Sholem was saying, when we are back to Israel, we are returning to history. Meaning, we know first of all our boundaries. This is the easiest way of the Jew to go from one place to another because his identity is in his head. He doesn't have to change his language, he doesn't have to change his, his uh, the basic elements of his homeland, he can go from one place to another because his identity is there. And this is the movement of the Jews all over history. You see the, the, the immigration of the Jews and the movement of the Jews from east to west in, in quantities. And all history is full of the immigration and immigration of Jews all over the world. So first of all, you are in territory. You have boundaries. You know when you start and where are you and where is the other, where is the other. Like you are in Hungary, you know where is Hungary and you don't, and you know where is Czechia. You know your house, you know your home. And the home, the homeland is creating identity. First of all, territory is creating identity. But it is created also by the language. And it is created by understanding the history of others. And you have to evaluate yourself not according to big, unclear myth, but do you have to evaluate yourself in comparison to the history of other people. You are not com comparing yourself in the absolute middle, but you are dealing yourself with, with other people. And what the, your history is not an absolute history. It is history among the history of others. And then you can say, here I failed, here I was correct, here I can change myself, 
I can change myself, I can change the fundamental elements of my identity. I don't have to keep them in a kind of an absolute area. I can change myself and stay and still <coughs> remain the same. Still remain the same, even by changing yourself. You are looking upon other people in historical way. If you take, for example, the Israelis that were returning to Hebron, the settlers, when they return back to Hebron, they say, okay, this was the land of our grandfather of Abraham. They could jump in history from this time to 2,000 years ago. <coughs> but they didn't ask themselves never. What was happening in Hebron during the 2000 years that they, they haven't been there? Regarding other people, it's very important to understand the other people and to be all the time in touch and in comparison and to understand the history of others. There is something very noble in Zionism. When Zionism was started, some of the most, I would say, top intellectuals that were coming from East Europe, from Hungary, from Germany, and, and from, from Austria, they were becoming Orientalists. And they tried to understand the Arabs profoundly, not only on the political level. They tried to find the sources of the Jailia, of the, of the uh, uh, Arab uh, pre-Islamic uh, poetry. They tried to understand the structure of the uh, uh, village in Egypt. They have done profound studies in order to say to themselves, we are now living in the Middle East, this hour is, will be our neighbors forever, so we have to study them and to be very careful to understand them profoundly. In this sense, I have to say that it is not easy. It's not easy to direct our identity, to change it into an historical one. First of all, because our relationship with America. America was built in a, on a myth. People were leaving Europe, throwing their private history behind them, and came to America as individuals. And this was, this, this is the charter of the creation of America. We are coming as individuals, and we try, and we <coughs> find here liberty and the open borders for all our uh, uh, qualities, and all our uh, uh, ambition. In this sense, the relationship between Israel and America, the strong are driving the identity of Israel, the, the effort of returning to history, still to base ourselves into mythology. Secondly, of course, religion. Religion that is still strong in Israel. Stalinism religion is always functioning on mythology. And of course, the way in which we are in hostility because of our neighbors don't allow us to smooth the relationship into historical thing and keep them in mythology. The problem of mythology is when you are working on mythology, the others, the non-Jews, were regarding us as a mythos. Some of the basic element of antisemitism, and you can see it here and all over history, antisemitism wasn't started with Christianity. Antisemitism was already in the ancient world before Christianity. Antisemitism, you see it in the Muslim world. Antisemitism, you see it in, among secular countries like Germany, Nazi, and Soviet Union. 
you are becoming a mythology to others, a bad mythology. And you, and you treat the Jews in a mythology way and you can, I would say, uh, create terrible lies about the Jews by saying they are mythologic people, but not in the sense that we are looking upon them, upon ourselves, but upon the way in which they interpreted us. The work of history is a very difficult way. What can help very much the knowledge of history and the creation of historical identity is of course art. Art is doing a very important job of creating a, a historical a identity. You see, you see it, for example, with the British and the English. How many times they will play Shakespeare? But they are playing Shakespeare not only because Shakespeare is a great playwright, of course. But the repetition of Shakespeare is also the repetition of understanding the codes of the kingdom, the codes of the classes in their history. And by seeing themselves on stage in the clothes and in the uniform of the great grandfathers, they can relate themselves to the history to see what was wrong and what was good, and I would say internalize the codes into themselves. The French are doing it in in uh, uh, with the uh, with the, the classic Molière, Racine, and others, and every people is doing it. Art is a very good medium to create the memory of history to understand history, to repeat the history. I say it because in the Jewish history, it's very difficult to do it. I want to speak here about my experience of it. I was thinking about returning to Jewish history by going back to the first millennium, when in the first millennium, as you know, there was a change in the Jewish communities and the Jewish conception. The halachic center in Babylon was declining, and two halachic new elements, new centers, was creating in the, in the end of the first millennium. The halachic center in North Africa and then in Spain, that was creating the magnificent period of what we call the golden age of Spain. And then the halachic centers that was created in Ashkenaz, in Germany, near the Black Forest. And this was the new element of what we call Chachmei Ashkenaz. This was one of the basic of the Haredim that you see now everywhere in Israel and elsewhere. I wanted to, to a little bit to understand how Jews were coordinating the codes between themselves, even when they were out of their country and without any authority that can impose the new code. The Pope was introducing the codes to the Christian world, to the Catholic world. Kings and princes were imposing codes of morality, of culture in their communities. But in the Jewish world there was not authority. There was not a common authority that can impose on the whole Jewish, and especially the Jews that were living apart from each other. Jews were living here and Jews were living there. In, in, in the Jewish saying, there is something very smart, uh, saying, Aselcharav, make your own rabbi. Meaning, you do your rabbi. You choose who will be your rabbi. If you don't like this rabbi, you choose another one. You will not say to a Christian, 
uh, uh, if you don't like the cardinal, may choose another cardinal. This is, this is the hierarchy of the church and you cannot avoid it. And I wanted through a story that I created in the journey to the end of the millennium, I was creating a story about a man who has two women in, the, in North Africa. In this time, 90% of the Jews were living in the Islam world. Only 10% of the Jews were living in the Christian world. Very strange because all was changed just before the Holocaust. 93% of the Jews were living in the Christian world and only 7% of the Jews were living in the Islam world. So, I wanted through the question of bigamy, through the question of what is the halachic code of having, working with bigamy or monogamy, especially by the fact that in Ashkenaz there was the declaration of the new amendment that a Jew must have only one woman and he cannot have two women. With allow, not must have, but he's allowed to have one woman and not two women. But in the, in the south, among the Jews that were living in the Islamic world, the permission to live with two women was very natural. So the conflict was between how these two codes can coordinate themselves without an authority, without someone as a rabbi, chief rabbi, or chief uh, king that can say, this is the code, and now you have to oblige and to obey to it. The story, I don't want now to tell all the story, this, we are already uh, uh, far in the time, but I want to say that my work with Jewish history was difficult, but in the same time, amazing. Because we don't know, we did not preserve what I would call the physical materials of our grandfather. In Poland, three million Jews were living just before the Holocaust. Now, if you go to Poland and ask, show me the synagogue of the Jews in the 14th century or in the 13th century, you will not be able to find nothing. How Jews were dressed in the 15th century, how was the kitchen of the Jews in the 7th century, you will not be able to find it. Because the preservation of the material of the Jews, the Jews did not do it because they were all the time regarding the place as a Temporarily. One day they will leave and go to Israel. One day the Mashiach will come and they will have to go. So the question of preservation, the place was not home, was not homeland. So the question of rebuilding historical context in a novel, it was very important to do it only through text. And the Jewish and the Israeli historians were helping me a lot. I have to go to them and ask them how the Jews were dressed and how the Jews were praying at this time and what was here and what was there. It was a boat that was going, the, the, the man with his two women was going from south to Paris in order to, uh, uh, I would say, to uh, abolish the harem that was on him by, by the Ashkenazi. And in studying history and in recreating history, you are recreating, you are recreating history in a novel, in a work of art. As for example, I see the French are doing it in, in films in the, from the 14th century, the Retour of Martin Guerre, the, the Return of Martin Guerre, and some things that they can recreate history. Immediately, this makes it easy for people to understand history and to relate to the relativity of history. I don't want to go to the details of this uh, uh, novel, 
But I would say that, of course, I avoid many mistakes. For example, when I was asking my historian if I can give to my protagonist to eat potatoes, they would say, be careful, in the, in the first millennium, you have, they have to wait 500 years in order to get potatoes or to drink tea, or to do something like that. So I was very careful not to do anachronism with my uh, uh, historical details. But in the same time, there was a wonderful revelation. For example, the revelation that there was a synagogue of women, synagogue of women, that was praying with Talit and Philin in Vermeiser in the 11th century. You see the struggle today in Israel in, uh, among the Kotel Amaravi, the world <coughs> war, about the question of women are uh, praying with Talitot and all the demonstration of the Haredim against them. But 1,000 years ago, the Haredim was more liberal than they are today. And they were less fanatic. So you get an attitude and you get an insight about history. And you can say that history, you can learn from history, you can change history. I will finish and I will give some time to questions. This is, I would say, the crossing road of Israel today. The obstacle are, first of all, you, Jews in the diaspora, that are still working on mythology and not on history. <laughs> And, uh, and by relating to you and by seeing you with one of, of our brothers, we have to adopt ourselves to mythology and not to history. In the same time, the question of globalization. The globalization, the Jew in the globalization is a master. I see already, I was now a little bit wondering in, in uh, in Budapest, in the center of Budapest, and I hear Hebrew and Hebrew here, not from tourists, but from people who are coming to do you know, business here and business there. Mm -hmm. The Jew is a master of globalization. He will enjoy globalization because he was already enjoying globalization in the Middle Ages. The international merchants were Jews because he could be everywhere with Jews and find Jews to do business with. So globalization is also an obstacle to, to uh, uh, the development of history. But if we want to stay in Eretz Israel, and if we want to see the state of Israel something forever, and this is the last station, station we have to work more on history and less on mythology. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you me. very much, Alfred Yeshua, sure for a fascinating uh, uh, lecture. And I would like to open the floor for questions. That the history in, in every age is the history of the ruling classes. And the big masses in every historical sense, they are living outside the history. In that sense, how you interpret the, the position of the Jewish position in there? European Middle Ages or in the Roman Empire and so on. There's inside and outside, the big masses in that sense. I think that in the last years, in the last century, there was a lot of attention to the real history of the masses and not only the history of the ruling, of the ruling class. I, I know my teacher, I had a teacher, Professor Javits, who some of his books upon the Roman Empire was concentrating on the proletarian and the slaves in, in Rome in the first and the second century. So I think that a good historian today will not satisfy himself by dealing only with the ruling class, whatever, if there were democratically elected or not democratically elected. So the dealing with, with the masses, with the movement, with the popular movement, is part of history. And in this sense, uh, the Jews is also part of it in the different countries in which they were living. Yes. 
you touched on something that's very important, especially here in Hungary, in today's historical context. Globalization, very cogently said, is for the Jews. It's invented by us. If it's not invented by us, it should have been invented by us. I today look Google all the time, what's the next place to live at? Even though I have a place in America and here and Israel as well. The point is, this is what the European anti-Semites in Hungary especially, the code word for Jew in Hungary, when you don't want to say Jew in a pejorative sense, you say cosmopolitan. We are, we are insulted by being globalized people who do not have a homeland, who do not uh, favor the flag of the country they live in. So this, this is also mythology because actually, in Poland before the war, as well as in Hungary before the war, as well as in Germany before the war, the Jews who lived here considered themselves here Hungarian, they're Polish, they're German, they were totally mesmerized that all of a sudden they are not foreigners. And this is the psychotic or neurotic experience of the Jew, and you are totally right until everybody somehow feels that they have an identity for a geographical reason, Eretz Israel, at one point, whether it's my grandchildren or myself at one point, anybody, we will always have this schism. Because no other country will naturally accept this Jew phenomenon as being part of that country. And the Jew himself, even in himself, like the Israelis that are living here and doing business, and say they're going to go back to Israel, usually they don't end up going back. The Los Angeles Israelis end up staying in Los Angeles because they can make a better living and they don't think in geographical context. They think in very practical, rational things. So I think it's very cogent what you said, philosophically thought out, and appreciate that you're here. Thank you. Yes, please. I would like to comment on the last topic. You said about history, that Israel should go to the history but, but how could it be when in Israel you have two completely different populations? One is the secular, who really go for the history, and one is the religious, who go for the mythology. And you see that there is no bridge between them. Actually, they're going more and more to be apart from each other. So what is the future? I have to say to you that the religious in Israel, even if you say they base themselves on mythology, the basic ideas of the functioning of of uh, their identity, still they are obliged to be in history. Because they have to decide about questions they never decided as Jews. They have to decide how far you can go in torturing terrorists in order to get from him, from him uh, information. You have to decide, you are, they are sitting in the parliament with secular people and have to decide if there will be homosexual marriage or no. So, and they have to decide about what to do, if to buy another aeroplane or to do an imp improvement of an hospital. So, by being part of the discussion, of everyday discussion, on practical matters and historical matters in Israel, they are pushed, they can be pushed from mythology to history. Of course, it is not easy, and some of them want to be totally separating from all this business, the fanatic and the Haredi, but, and this is now the, the fight of the government in order to mobilize the Haredim, in order to put them in history, to put them in daily relationship with the occupation, with the army, with all these things. If we will succeed in doing this, I think we will do a lot of improvement in the way to history and not to mythology. So I have a, a question on the other side of the story. I understand that uh, history and methodolo methodology are metaphors in your case. So it's not pure history and pure that. But if Israel is becoming totally historical, what's happening with the Jews living in the diaspora who are still living in the methodology, in the myths? It comes up, I mean, let's 
Let's raise the question that way. I mean, is an Israeli who is not living in the myths anymore, but it's a, a historical animal with territory, with state, with terror, etc. Is he a Jew or not, in that sense? Of course, he's an Israeli, and the Israeli is the total Jew. But is that the a different Israeli, Jew? So it's, you have still the Jews in the diaspora living in the, in the myths, yeah. and then you have Israel, creating, in a modern way, a national state, yes. an anti-globalist state, if you want, in a sense. <laughs> I'm not saying it's good or bad, but just yes. I'm saying here there is a controversy. Yes, but we are now half of the Jewish people. We are half of the Jewish people today. Yes. And we say the, the real half, because the half in the diaspora, some of them are not Jews, but Hungarian from a Jewish origin, American from a Jewish origin, etc. Et yes. So the question is, are you attaching yourself to the totality, to history, or you are remaining with your mythology? And this is the test for community in here or in other places. And if you want to survive, you have to attach yourself more to the historical elements of Israel that are now created to encourage them, especially language. Language is extremely important. I don't have to come here and to speak in English. I have to speak in Hebrew. And you have to understand me in Hebrew. Hebrew must be the language, at least to do the effort. If you cannot leave your business here and your position here and go to Israel, at least understand Hebrew. Hebrew was a common language of the Jews in history, and now people had abandoned the languages. They want to do Judaism without the language. So in this sense, I, I think that it is important for your survival to be attached to us, to help us in our historical thing, and in this sense, especially the secular community among the Jews in the diaspora, have to help us and to clear our boundaries. You see, there is something strange that Israel for 40 years don't know what with their boundaries yet. yet. And we are, and this is not to have boundaries, not to have clear boundaries. It is an element of our mythological identity. I have a question about art. You said very rightly, and I couldn't agree more, that uh, art is a medium of recreating history, or of creating the memory of history. Now, if art is done very well, doesn't it have the power to create myth? I am now thinking of William Faulkner, the American writer, who uh, went against the common myth of America and created a historical uh, view of the South, of, of uh, the Southern states of America and the Southern identity. But by way of returning to history, he managed to create a mythology. So what I'm asking is whether art, if done very well, is able to create myth. Yes, of course art can From also history. create great mythology. If you take Moby Dick of the classical American novel, it is done outside America, only in the sea, the fighting with the, how do you say? The well. The well. 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 And, and, uh, and this is a metaphor for this. But see, for example, War and Peace of Tolstoy. Who would remember the war of Napoleon against Russia in 1812? Who would remember it? But because of war and peace of Tolstoy, hundreds, millions of people remembering till now the question, the, the war that was done there. So his art can create memory and help history to be memorized. And in this sense, of course, they are creating also myth. The, the boundaries, as you say, are not clear, but the direction it is a, a very important. Yes, please. Main characters, double wives, do not have names. I don't. I don't. The double wives, the do wives, have names. The two wives of Benatar don't ah. have names. Why? Ah, the guy. Ah, you're thinking about the book itself. Every other uh, uh, lady figures have names. 
wives now? Our wives, we don't have names. Because uh, <laughs> this is a very difficult question, and I was <laughs> encountering this question many times. I don't think that the people know the book. But I wanted very much to speak not about the persons of the two women, and especially about the battle between them and their rivalry, if I would give them names. So I stay with the concept of two women. And this is the reason why I was saying the first woman and the second woman. I don't know if my uh, suggestion or my uh, solution was good. I know many, many people was angry with me but uh, 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 about not giving them names. But I wanted to specify the fact that there are going two women, one the first, one the second, and they are coming to the story as the first and the second, and not with, uh, I would say, more detailed personality. When I was creating the libretto of the opera, and the opera was magnificent, um, you can see the DVD of it, and then I had to give them because they wanted to sing. And I could not speak to them to, them, to make them silent. The actress, the singer was saying, give us text, we want text. So I have to oblige myself to give them more personality, more detailed personality by giving them speeches. Yes, please. One could say, and as far as I know, some people say that the last 2,000 years proved that living in meat at least makes jewelry survive. Now, history always led to disaster. So one could argue that just the opposite, living in meat is the, 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 the secret of survival. Living in history is always a problem. And Haradim basically say that they defend Israel, not the idea. I mean, paying. You dare to say that meat is, <laughs> is giving the terrible disaster that the Jewish people had, or because he was living in mythology. He did not understood what is around him. I see, and I was saying it, and Jews were very angry with me, that the Holocaust is also our failure. Our failure. We are not responsible. Of course, the responsibility is there, but the failure that we did not understand the interactions that we are creating with the world <coughs> by such a living. And in this sense, you know, the problem of survival is not important for me. If I would have said to you something that perhaps is dreadful, if I would be a naked Jew, in front of the crematorium, just before entering them, I would say to myself, for God's sake, why I re why my father were remaining me Jews? Because I now I am killed for nothing. Because the Germans did not kill us for ideology, not for money, not for race, because we never had been raised, not for uh, economic, for not for nothing, not for religion. And this. And for the Jews, it was, for many, many Jews, this was the end. They didn't care about survival. This was a terrible blow. We will not get rid of this blow. We, we, we are handicapped. We are crippled towards, towards our last days. A third of our people were killed like this with all the generations that could come from. So, the problem is not for me survival. There were many people that didn't survive, so what? They are less good. Survival by itself is a value. The problem is how to survive. What is the content of your survival? And this is the question that we are facing today, even in Israel. May I continue? Yeah, but Israel is half of the world jewelry. What? Israel is just half. The yeah. other half, let's say, simplifying the USA. And they say, at least some of those Jews, that Israel is, is a, yeah, this kind of historic jury. We are the meat jury. 
Okay, I don't, the, as I say, so it's two to the kind one, of two, yeah? the question is not, we, we're not comparing, you are, this is the fact. I am Israeli. For me, Israel is my skin and not my jacket. I cannot leave Israel because when I will leave Israel, I will destroy my whole identity. My identity is based upon territory, about language, like the, the, the identity of an Hungarian peasant here in, in Hungary. This is the identity. I am not a Jew with jackets. Now Hungarian, tomorrow French, then Canadian. This, this, this. A very bad uh, uh, comparison to Hungarian peasants. I don't think I would want to be compared to the Hungarian peasant. <laughs> it's not a very positive comparison. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. I have three uh, announcements. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, invite you. Uh, there is books by uh, translation by Alephet Yeshua that can be uh, heard here. And uh, I, I, I understand that uh, Alephet Yeshua would um, Sign it. Um, the <coughs> second announcement is that we are having a, a, another program uh, in our book week uh, or book day uh, with the doctor, with the professor Obi Friedman, and he will give here um, a lecture or a book launch on Monday. So, and you are all, all welcome. And the third announcement is that we also have a reception, a nice reception outside, and you are most welcome to. <laughs> <laughs>